Hello everyone. Today I'd like to talk through the mechanism of a proline catalyzed aldol reaction as a general introduction to the field of organocatalysis, but also an anti-selective synthesis. If you like the style of this video, please do give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. Okay, so just as an introduction, I'm just going to run through some general carbonyl chemistry. If I have a general aldehyde like this, which has enolizable protons in the alpha position, I can react it easily with secondary amines in the presence of an acid catalyst and form an enamine and water. So this is an enamine. It's an okay nucleophile. It's not charged though. It's a better nucleophile than say an enol because the nitrogen known pair is higher in energy, but it's not as good a nucleophile as an enolate that has a full negative charge. And we'd expect this to be nucleophilic in the alpha position here. Now generally this will be E selective because you're under thermodynamic control. All the reactions in the formation of this enamine are reversible. So just as a reminder, you need to activate this aldehyde to get any nucleophilic attack first. Then the lone pair on, say, this pyrrolidine can come and attack and we expel water. And the reason why this E geometry is the thermodynamic enamine is that it minimizes one free allylic strain. Just using this hydrogen here, we can see using the Hauk model that this will be the preferred geometry where you eclipse that hydrogen with the methylene group in green. So how people tend to use this in synthesis, well, you could form the enamine using dehydrating conditions such that you remove the water. Then our equilibrium arrow just becomes a forward arrow and you can form the enamine. The enamine would then react with really good electrophiles, but also preferably soft ones. So some of the best things to react enamines with are alpha halocarbonyls or Michael acceptors, for example. But what I'd like to do now is have a look at how we use this enamine in an aldol type reaction. So to start with, well, we, we have a pretty soft nucleophile and the carbonyl would normally be considered quite hard. So we'd need to activate the aldehyde component in some way. So perhaps I could do that just with an acid or a Lewis acid. But before we go there, I'd like to use the fact that we form the enamine in the first place using a reversible reaction. So therefore it's possible that we both have an electrophile and a nucleophile in the same reaction at the same time. In fact, more so than that, we have catalytic acid in here. So it's always possible to activate our aldehyde and make it a good electrophile well, a better electrophile for an enamine. So the question becomes, what would happen if we did a self-reaction where the enamine attacks some of the aldehyde that's already in the flask? So you form one molecule of your enamine, it attacks some of the remaining aldehyde in there. Now, initially that attack will form a hydroxyl group and an aminium ion. So with the water hanging around, we can hydrolyze the aminium down to the aldehyde and we can form this self-aldol product. Now I'll just note that this aldehyde here is a more hindered aldehyde than the starting material because of this alpha branching here. So that means hopefully it should stop reacting in preference to the starting material going again. And the consequences of forming an aldol product like this in these conditions is the focus for the rest of this video. So just examining this aldol product to start with, we identify that there are two stereogenic centers here. So it's possible under these reaction conditions to form four stereoisomers. We could form the stereoisomer that has both of the groups coming forwards. Or we could form its enantiomer where they're both going backwards. So these two here are enantiomers. But this pair of stereoisomers here are one diastereomer. And I'm just going to call this the one, two, sin diastereomer. The remaining two stereoisomers will be related to the one, two, anti diastereomer such that we could have the hydroxyl group forwards, for example, and the R group pointing back. So those are a one, two anti relationship to each other. Or we could have it's an antima where the hydroxyl group is pointing backwards and the R group is pointing forwards. So these two are also an antimas. So the point of enantioselective organocatalysis is can we use the reaction to just form one of these stereoisomers? So not just one diastereomer, but also one enantiomer. And one of the good ways of doing this is to use proline as a catalyst. Now proline is an amino acid and it has the form of the pyrrolidine ring that we had before, but with a carboxylic acid group pointing off here. But also note that this will be a chiral center as well. This is the so-called natural form of proline. This is L-proline and it's all over our natural world. So it's super cheap. Just popping back over to the left-hand side of the screen, we can see how we might be able to use proline in a reaction like this because it's got the secondary amine that we needed for forming the enamine, but also it carries with it an acidic proton. So these are all the right conditions for forming an enamine in the first place. You could almost call this a bifunctional catalyst. But the fact that the catalyst is bifunctional means that we can also exploit the stereochemistry here 
for enantioselectivity in a reaction. Remember that we also needed this acidic proton to activate the electrophile. So let's work through the consequences of all of this. Under these conditions, if I were to react my aldehyde with proline in a catalytic amount, I should form in a reaction flask a combination of my starting material aldehyde and this enamine. So we know if we want this enamine to react with the aldehyde, I'm going to need to acid activate the aldehyde, make it a better electrophile. And we can imagine doing something like that by hydrogen bonding another aldehyde onto our enamine. This will give me a little bit of activation. But also that now sets us up for an intramolecular reaction. So for example, I could draw the arrows looking like this. So these types of cyclic transition states are really good if you want a diastereoselective transformation. But because we've got a stereocenter here at the top, we can also get some enantioselectivity for this reaction as well. However, unusually, we've got quite a big ring in the middle here. So we wouldn't expect it to be in such a defined conformation for a transition state that, say, a six-membered ring would be. But it's been proposed that there is an extra bit of locking in this transition state for this reaction, whereby there could be another hydrogen bond to the basic nitrogen lone pair to lock us into a 6-5 ring system. Now that should have some much more defined geometries, and this is the proposed transition state for the reaction, where the lowest energy transition state will be, will be where the six-membered ring is in a chair conformation, and as many of its groups are equatorial as possible. This is an extension of the zinnemann traxler model. So I'm just going to build up my transition state structure here on the right. This is just the bare bit of my enamine. It's an e-geometry, of course, because it's formed under reversible conditions, hence thermodynamic control. So I'll just put that extra hydrogen in here to remind us. So for the aldol part of this transition state, I'm going to react out of the front down this green dotted line and attack the aldehyde. Now, as we said, the aldehyde was activated by a proton that's on the proline, so that's delta plus, and the nitrogen can participate in another hydrogen bond here. So this is our six membered ring core of our aldol transition state. Now coming off this nitrogen, we have a five membered ring and coming forwards, we have a carboxylic acid. Going back into the plane is the remaining hydrogen. So if you like, the proline is holding the electrophile on the front face of the enamine here as drawn. Now there's a choice of two positions for the remaining R group. There's an axial and an equatorial position still spare on this ring. And as per usual, to minimize one free diaxial strain, we probably prefer to put the hydrogen in the pseudo axial position and put the remaining alkyl group in the equatorial position. And this is our transition state for the diastereoselective and enantioselective aldol reaction. Now, it depends how good your 3D is on this to see what the product is. Remember, this component is going to become the iminium ion, which will later become the aldehyde. And here, that this will become the hydroxyl group at the front. So I'm just going to draw a sawhorse projection to start with. At the back, I'll have the aldehyde component. And then coming forwards, I've got my new carbon-carbon bond. And at the front, I've got three positions where the hydrogen will be down, the hydroxyl group will be up on the right-hand side, and the remaining alkyl group will be on the left-hand side. Now, just to translate this into a 2D representation, what I normally do is look for a little zigzag. So taking a little zigzag all the way through from one R group to the aldehyde, I can then say that this is equivalent to... So to start with, I'll draw my zigzag in 2D. So that's the R group going all the way to the aldehyde. You can see that zigzag here. The hydroxyl group here will, is in front of the hydrogen, so that's coming forwards on my picture. And the remaining R group, well, that's out the back relative to the hydrogen, so the R group is back. So the take-home message here is that we form the 1,2 anti-diastereomer as one enantiomer. Now, this type of idea is not just limited to a catalytic asymmetric aldol reaction. We can also use other electrophiles that use the same sort of bifunctional structure here. So I've just drawn the transition state again with a small gap at the front. We can put in other electrophiles that need to be activated. And in fact, a classic way of doing this would be to use some sort of manic reaction. So a manic reaction would be where, well, we've used a primary amine and maybe formed some sort of imine. So I'm just going to put two different aromatic groups on here and use this as my electrophile. Now, of course, the lone pair on the nitrogen there, that nitrogen lone pair there will outcompete any oxygen lone pair for coordination via hydrogen bonding. 
So the nitrogen lone pair will slot in here and the imine will slot into the transition state. And this has a slightly odd effect of forcing us to put our remaining groups one up here, that's just a well group. So the remaining a well group will be forced into the pseudo axial position, leaving the hydrogen in the pseudo equatorial position. And we can enantio selectively form one product again from this. So just having a look at the sawhorse projection of the product at the back, we will have the same as we had before. Coming forwards, got three more positions. This time, the hydrogen will be on the left-hand side and amine will be on the right-hand side. So one way to see how this relates to the structure we had before, I'm just going to rotate just a 120 twist. And now we can see if we take the zigzag, that both the hydrogens are on the same face, right, as in at the front. Well, this time we've still got the R group at the back, but the amine is also back. So this is our product from this reaction. It's actually the one two syn diastereomer to use the normal nomenclature. We also still form one enantiomer of this selectively. Okay, so just going back to my transition state, I'm just going to take my imine out of the transition state and I'm going to put something else in its place. Quite a cool thing you can do with this is to react this with nitrosyl benzene. That's a benzene with an NO group attached to it, not NO2, just NO. Now this has the structure like this. And ordinarily, we'd expect nucleophiles to attack this at the nitrogen because the oxygen is more electronegative. However, in this transition state, the key point for activating is the fact that the nitrogen lone pair is more basic than the oxygen lone pair. It's a higher energy lone pair. So when we slot this into the transition state structure, the nitrogen has to do the hydrogen bonding, and we actually see reaction directly at the oxygen. The phenyl group will be forced to go up here. So if we now do our nucleophilic attack, we actually form a product with an NO single bond. As always, I've got the back of my sawhorse projection, but off the front here, I'll have an oxygen, and after workup, I'll, well, I'll have an NH and a phenyl group. So here, we've actually only formed one stereocenter, and I can just quickly redraw that into the 2D form, and we formed an alpha chiral aldehyde with an oxygen substituent. I'll also just note that if we do some sort of reduction chemistry here, non-nucleophilic, of course, otherwise we'll react with the aldehyde, we might be able to cleave that NO bond carefully and form this alpha hydroxy aldehyde as one enantiomer. Now, one of my favorite tricks that you can do with this reaction is to do a desymmetrization to form quite a complicated looking bicyclic scaffold using just the proline catalysis. So starting with this readily available diketone, note that we've got some acidic protons in the middle, I'm just going to alkylate a little bit in the middle, but at all points, I'm going to keep the symmetrical nature of this. So there's a mirror plane through the middle. So I'm just going to skip over the details here, but say I put sodium hydride in first, I would deprotonate that acidic proton, form a good nucleophile, and then say I put in this methyl vinyl ketone, that should then do conjugate addition. But there's two acidic protons at the start. So just deprotonating the remaining one with sodium hydride again, and reacting with methyl iodide, I would have alkylated twice in that position between the two ketones to give me this product. And just so that I'm super clear here, I'm just going to make a note, this is not chiral. This carbon uh, labeled has two equivalent groups coming off it. Or another way that we can think about that is that the mirror plane is still retained because that carbon is tetrahedral. So actually one of these will be coming forwards and one of them will be going backwards. So this molecule will be superimposable on its mirror image. So next I'm going to react this intermediate with the proline catalyst and we can have a think about where it's best to form an enamine here and the idea will be to form an enamine and do an intramolecular reaction onto one of the other ketones. Now the most likely place to form a stable enamine would be to using this dangly ketone over here. So it'd be possible maybe to form an enamine at this alpha center but if we look that's only four carbons away from the ketone. Doesn't matter which one we go for. So we're only likely to get a productive reaction there. But luckily, as we said right at the start, these enamine formations will always be reversible. And when we form the enamine on this terminal site, we will get a productive reaction. So the key reactive intermediate is this one drawn here. So we have the nucleophilic component in a one two, three, four, five, six. Well, it's six to either ketone and the ketone can act as an electrophile. But remember, we needed to activate the electrophile in these reactions using hydrogen bonding to the carboxylic acid proton. 
So let's see what happens when we try to use our transition state. Okay, so this is the core of the transition state. Again, this bit in yellow is just where we can slot in an electrophile, but it's going to be an intramolecular reaction here. Now I'm just going to draw the rest of this in in purple so that it stands out. So one of the ketones will end up in this position and be activated towards attack. So I'm just going to trace around my numbered carbons. I've got carbon number one here, carbon number two. So carbon number three must come off down the back. Off my ketone at the front, I've got two substituents. Now somehow I need to join this one up to here because that pseudo-equatorial substituent will no way reach that carbon three. The ketone itself is carbon six. So I need this to be carbon five. And perhaps we could just draw this connected round like this with carbon number four in the middle. Now just to close off the final ring. So the five-membered ring is the starting material. There's one more ketone. And then there's just the question of where does the methyl group like to go on carbon five? Now, if we think about the stereochemistry here, that methyl group has to come forwards to give us the lowest energy transition state. We can see round here that carbons two, three, and four are going backwards into the plane of the paper with respect to a new stereocenter on carbon five. We'll also note that carbon six, where we've attacked with the enamine, is also a new stereocenter. And this is why this reaction is called a desymmetrization. We started off with a non-chiral starting material. We used a chiral catalyst and will form one enantiomer of a chiral product at the end. So I'm quickly going to relate this to a 2D structure. And I'm going to focus on the fact that, well, this ketone that's being attacked at carbon six, it's being attacked from the back face. So we'd expect that hydroxyl group to be coming forwards as drawn after the reaction. So my product will be a 6-5 ring system, the untouched ketone down the bottom here. My numbering system from before would go around like this. So the original carbon two, well, that's back as a ketone. The ketone that was attacked on carbon six, well, that's going to be coming forwards. And the methyl group on carbon five, that's now also coming forwards. So we form this product in high diastereoselectivity, so high DR, diastereomeric ratio, and high enantiomeric excess, that's EE. Okay then, that's me done for today. I hope this has been informative as a video, perhaps as an introduction to asymmetric catalysis or organocatalysis or both. If you enjoyed it, please do consider giving the video a like and subscribing to my channel so that you know when more content drops.